Welcome to Manifold. Today's guest is Richard Hanania. It's pretty hard for me to describe Richard to someone who doesn't know him. But what I might say is he's a guy who has a traditional academic background, but somehow escaped and has established himself as a well-known public intellectual already at a fairly young age. And I, I think it's fair to say with the help of the internet. Yeah. So, uh, Richard, I, I think I became aware of you mainly through Twitter and podcasts and various people referred to you, I think, as having very insightful takes or views on all kinds of things, a very large range of things, which I think the audience will come to understand, you know, by the end of our discussion that, that you're, you've got a very active mind and you're actually thinking about lots of different things. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with just a little bit of your personal history because, you know, great minds like yours don't just materialize fully <laughs> formed on the earth. So somehow there's a development process and I find it, and I think a lot of listeners find it really interesting to follow that or learn about that development process. So I'm just going to list some things from your personal history and then just let you riff on them. Go on as long as you want, or just uh, comment a little bit on the aspects of your biography that I'm going to go through. Sure. So you went to law school at the University of Chicago and at the time were you thinking you were going to become a lawyer, it was not a stop along the way toward becoming a professor, was it? No, not really. So I went to law school, you know, for the same reason that a lot of people go to law school. I mean, I was sort of lost in a, an undergrad. I mean, I went to um, the University of Colorado. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I just went to the University of Colorado, really sort of not thinking. I just had an idea that Colorado seemed like a cool place to be. So I just, I went there. I um, got a major in linguistics, but I really wasn't, I didn't really have a direction. I mean, I just started, you know, reading things I was interested in. I was just, you know, sort of hanging out and, you know, finishing my classes. And then it came time to graduate and I sort of didn't know what to do. I, I thought about grad school. You know, it's hard to start thinking about grad school in like your last year of, of college. I mean, I didn't really have you know, any research background. I didn't know if I would be competitive in, you know, different, different programs. I thought about, you know, something like political science, anthropology, something like that. So I, you know, I, I applied to law school. I, I took the LSAT and, you know, you can go to law school without having any background. Law school was basically just your GPA and your LSAT. So I could get into a really good law school, but I couldn't really get into an elite academic program, any kind of PhD program. And so, yeah, I, I decided I would be practical and, you know, become a lawyer. About midway through law school, end of my first year, within my second year, I sort of decided that, you know, the corporate life was not for me. I was just too interested in ideas. I just, you know, spend my free time reading. I wasn't really the idea of going to a firm and working uh, 60 hours a week, which is what a lot of people that go to a place like University of Chicago end up doing. It just had zero appeal to me. And so, you know, the University of Chicago was, it was a great experience because I'd come from a, you know, very non-elite background. Most of the people I went to high school with didn't go to college. My parents are first generation. They came over from the Middle East. So I, I really didn't have anybody uh, sort of directing me to, any, towards anything like an academic path. About midway through law school, I thought, you know, okay, I want to be in the world of ideas. And so, and so University of Chicago was actually a great and formative intellectual experience because it was the first time I was really around people who were who were as smart as me, to be frank. And, you know, we had a program grounded in law and economics. I found that very interesting. I, you know, I found it great to be actually be around people who maybe, maybe they weren't as intellectually curious as I was, but they were more intellectually curious than what I'd been used to. And so, so that was a great experience. And then, you know, second, third year, I'm looking at academia. I graduate from the University of Chicago Law School, sort of sunk cost fallacy. You know, I just, I just finish. And then I uh, go off to UCLA to get my PhD. And at what point did you decide on the specialization that you were going to have when you finally did your PhD? I decided on international relations. So that's a subfield of political science. I just loved reading history. I loved reading, you know, about sort of the trajectory of history, why we've gone to this place where war is much less common than before. I was interested in current events and I, you know, I wanted to understand it and study it at an academic level. So that pushed me towards international relations. What was it about UCLA that attracted you? 
Well, that was, it was like the best program that would take me, honestly. It was, you know, between UCLA and a few other places and UCLA was, you know, much a much nicer place to live. So I ended up going there. Yeah. And you're, and correct me if I'm wrong, you live in Southern California now. Is that right? Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. So I came out here and I, I settled out here with the COVID restrictions. It's been, you know, really getting to me out here, but yeah, this is still home for now. Yep. Yeah, I, I was an undergrad, I think near where you live now, I was an undergrad in Pasadena. It's so uh, pretty familiar with the area and, and actually spent a lot of time at UCLA at fraternity parties and things like this. So yeah, I definitely know the scene or at least the 1980s version of the scene. <laughs> uh, so after UCLA, you were a postdoc at Columbia and at that time, were you sort of solidly on the academic track or did you already think that you might be leaving uh, academia? So I was still on the academic track when I started at Columbia. I thought that I'd go there, I'd do a fellowship for two years, and then, you know, I'd find an academic job. You know, at some point, I sort of lost faith in what we were doing in a international relations. A lot of the stuff I did early was, you know, using these complex and fancy statistical methods to understand international politics. I think those methods tend to have a lot of problems with them. And the things that you could study sort of more, you know, I think with more rigor, they were too narrow. And so the studies you could do, you can answer a very narrow question that really didn't matter for the world. And I, I, I had gotten into it because I was interested in broad questions about, you know, history and sort of the nature of society and making sure we live in a world with less conflict. You know, there's not a lot of people doing that, at least very early in their careers in academia. You would think that's one of the things you might, you know, you might have a chance to do it in international relations. I don't think, you know, people tend to do that. I also thought that the people, the work that I was doing and the work I saw being done, I just thought it was too divorced from the real world. One of my interests has always been American politics. It's been international relations and I want to take what I know and what I find out and, you know, the tools that I have and try to apply them to the real world. So like, you know, about a year, you know, into my fellowship, about a year and a half, you know, I started just dipping my toes in the water. I, you know, I made a Twitter account. I was still on the academic track. So very, very, very careful. And, you know, the things I said just basically promoted my work. And then over time, I was just drawn into more into the public space. So the first thing I thought was, okay, maybe I'll go work for a think tank because that's something you, you might do if you have academic skills, but you don't necessarily uh, want to be a professor. And so I started working uh, with defense priorities and I still have an affiliation with them. So I started, you know, writing uh, reports and op-eds and, and stuff uh, for them. I, I would also talk, you know, about American politics and sort of the culture war issues. And that stuff actually started getting a lot more attention than the uh, foreign policy stuff. And people really thought I had something, you know, unique to say on these issues. And so now I've, you know, basically split my time between writing about American politics and also writing about geopolitical and foreign affairs. So this period that you're talking about where you're first getting on Twitter, is that something like 2018? Yeah, ex exactly. So 2018, more like 2019, but you know, for a while there, I had like, you know, no followers. I wasn't really anybody. I was just, you know, on Twitter, just posting like links to my academic articles and just articles that I found interesting. And then really in 2020, I start getting more attention. I start a CSPI, the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology that launches in December, 2020, right after the presidential election. And then uh, my Substack, I really don't start I might have started it in 2020, but it really doesn't take off. It doesn't really get any attention until about spring of 2021. So we're in, you know, it's, it hasn't been that long. This has been a very compressed schedule that I've been, you know, anything like a uh, public figure, but that's, that's sort of the timeline. You're blowing up like crazy, man. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Thank you. People say that. Yeah, I hope, uh, well, it's true. I mean, that the, the most puzzling thing for me is trying to figure out how I actually became aware of you because at some point. I became aware of you as somebody who says interesting and insightful things. And that's sort of how you got lodged in my brain. And I don't know how it actually happened. And then, of course, recently I've listened to a lot of your podcasts and, and read a bunch of your writing, which we'll come back to. But let me talk a little bit about CSPI. So that's the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology. And it's a nonprofit, 50C3, which you founded and you're the president of. Am I correct? Yes, that's right. And so I, I'd like, love to hear the story of how that thing was created, because that's a very unusual thing. Like the way that you got out of academia, you kind of left academia in style. I would say <laughs> you went from being a postdoc to, you know, running a very innovative not-for-profit. And let me, I'm going to read from the mission statement that's on your website. 
Now, before I do this, you, you could say if this is out of date or something and it, it sort of no longer characterizes what you guys are about, you can jump in and just give me the updated version. If not, I'm just going to read this because it, it, I think it really informs your worldview or what your worldview was when the statement was written. So over the last few decades, scientific and technological progress have stagnated. So you're starting with very strong statements, right? Scientists conduct more research than ever before, but groundbreaking innovation is scarce. At the same time, identity politics and political polarization have reached new extremes and social trends such as family stability and crime are worse than in previous decades and in some cases moving in the wrong direction. What explains these trends and how can we reverse them? Question mark. Much of the blame lies with the institutions we rely on for administration, innovation, and leadership. Instead of forward-looking governments, we have short-sighted politicians and bloated bureaucracies. Instead of real experts with proven track records, we have so-called experts who appeal to the authority of their credentials instead of political leaders willing to face facts and make tough trade-offs. We have politicians who appeal to ignorance and defer responsibility. To fix our institutions, we need to rethink them from the ground up. That is why CSPI supports and funds research into the administrative systems, organizational structures, and political ideologies of modern governance. Only by understanding what makes these systems so often dysfunctional can we change them for the better. And I want to say just to compliment you that, you know, I, I'm much older than you and I've been living in this world and, you know, gathering data and synthesizing theory, you know, hypotheses for a long time. But basically, I, I don't disagree with anything you, that you've written. Another guy who knows even more about institutions and political functioning, a friend of mine named Dominic Cummings, I think he would agree with everything that you've written there as well. So I was struck by that. I think it's a very concise statement of a particular worldview. I don't want to say the Doomer worldview, but it is kind of a decline of civilization worldview. Some of these issues like dysfunction of these institutions or limitations of politicians, maybe these are timeless, but maybe say a little bit about how you came to these conclusions. Yeah. So when I started CSPI, the idea was we were going to take social science and we were just going to do it better with a focus on political science and political psychology, which is two areas that I've researched on that I've written about. So the idea was you see political science, you see, you know, how People describe, for example, why conservatives and liberals are different and what motivates them. And the research is, is just very, if you're not sort of bought into the left-wing ideology of most professors, you could see the flaws on it. So I took a class in political psychology at UCLA and every week was just about subcognitive or moral defect that conservatives have. It's like conservatism and racism, conservatism and immigration. And they have something called, for example, system justification theory, where you, you have a need to uh, explain away inequality. And people who have this higher need to explain away inequality are more likely to be conservatives, just stuff like that. That's the quality of a lot of the, the research. And so I started CSPI with people who I thought we were, were doing some good political science or doing uh, more balance. We're giving us a more even and factual and nonpartisan view of the world. You know, no, no, no uh, science or field of research in the social sciences is completely free of ideology or, or partisanship. But I thought that, you know, we need some balance. The way, the way I put it was the intellectual and moral flaws of conservatism have been investigated to death. And, uh, the, you know, that doesn't mean that everything that people have found is untrue, but somebody should also be looking at what the other side is, what are some flaws or intellectual defects or moral inconsistencies that liberals have and that both sides, conservatives and liberals and, and whoever else, however else you want to categorize people, whatever they share in common. And so that, you know, we, we still do a lot of work along those lines, but I came to believe over time, I, you know, I was influenced by writings of Tyler Cohen, Patrick Collison, Peter Thiel, um, about the decline of progress. And I thought that there was a bigger story here. And I started to see identity politics and, you know, it's recently been called wokeness as part of a, a larger story in that there's been sort of ideological and bureaucratic capture of institutions. And, and I would say that the people who are on the right or moderates who complain about the political bias in academia, I don't think they take it seriously enough. I think that the ideas that, you know, disparities are caused by discrimination and that, you know, we live in a white supremacist society and we have this suspicion, this presumption against objective standards that will show any group differences and to use those in, you know, business or government. I think that's, that's a huge problem for competent government. Civil service examination, for example, was done away with because of disparate impact, because groups scored different differently on it. 
we can see with sort of the politically correct ideas about crime and the causes of crime. And I think we're largely false narratives about biased policing. We could see what's happened to the murder rate in the last two years, just historic rises. So I, I think there's a broader story here. It's not just that, oh, conservatives are discriminated against. We have a biased view of politics. It's some people and some ideas are not getting a uh, fair shake in academia. It's like these ideas are harmful and wrong, and they have a lot of real world consequences. You know, that's something that I think that the, the sort of the backlash to wokeness to identity politics has missed. And I think that the, the progress studies people, they're doing a lot of interesting things, but at the same time, I think a lot of them try to position themselves as centrist and don't really grapple with, you know, the cultural issues and sort of the, you know, the larger story here of, of what exactly is going on. So these, you know, these two concerns, the, the sort of the culture war issues, the sort of what I'd call the, the war on merit, the war on objectivity, along with the decline of progress. I think these are related issues and we deal with both of them at CSPI. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was a great summary there. I mean, so our listeners can already, I think, get a sense of the, the breadth of the topics that you're capable of engaging with. In this mission statement, though, I was kind of struck by the fact that it, it's true that a lot of the aspects of the viewpoint are maybe more often held by people on the right than on the left. But I think someone from the left looking at what the statement that I actually read would actually be completely sure that uh, you were on the opposite side of the ideological spectrum. Because some of these assertions like, okay, slow down in scientific and technological progress. There are plenty of people sort of left of center economists who might endorse that hypothesis. The idea that family stability and crime are worse than in previous decades. I, I think those are just quantitative measurements that people can make. The idea that politicians are enslaved by short term incentives and bloated bureaucracies. I, I think so a lot of these things are, are, I think, fairly neutral and maybe they arose from partially from your reaction, you know, to some very left-leaning material that you were taught in graduate school, but, but not all the claims really, I think, are right of center in nature. I don't know if you've listened to this podcast. I just, I just came upon it by accident. There were two very left of center professors at Cal State Northridge. I think one is maybe a philosopher and the other one is maybe a political scientist. They spent an hour and a half, I think, seriously discussing just you, Richard Anias. <laughs> I think they called it a conservative worldview, but probably not based on the, the stuff that's in the mission statement I read. But it was a very serious analysis of your worldview by two left of center academics. H have you heard that? Yeah, I did listen to that. And yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, like a lot of different things I write about and often somebody will sort of see a piece of it, but not see the other. So the foreign policy stuff and the American domestic policy stuff, they're often like in different worlds. So somebody will see me as just a, a conservative if they're reading the stuff on uh, wokeness and identity politics and civil rights law and where, I, where it came from. And somebody who's only come across my foreign policy writing is not going to call me a conservative. So the, those people had, you know, had found a, a very specific uh, set of essays that they were analyzing. On the broader point on the, the progress studies, yes, I think it's consciously nonpartisan. And there's a new uh, think tank in DC called the Institute for Progress that just opened up in the last week or so. Tyler Cohen is, you know, sort of seen as sort of the intellectual godfather of the progress studies intellectual movement. And I think people might say he's sort of right-leaning because he's pro-market and, you know, he's, he's this economist who likes, who likes markets and is skeptical of government in a lot of ways. Nobody would consider him like a conventional Republican or a conventional, you know, right-wing personality. So you're, you're right. There is nothing necessarily sort of partisan or, um, related to one side or the other uh, on these issues. Now I do have to say that to try to be, you know, nonpartisan and not to come down on one side or the other in the culture war, it can, it can have it, its advantages, but I think if you're trying to do that too hard and, you know, I have no problem with people who are trying to have as broad appeal as possible, particularly if they're working in Washington and have to actually convince politicians on a day to day basis on stuff to do, which is not what CSBI is trying to do. But I think that there should be somebody out there who is willing to take on questions related to progress and related to the state of institutions that is directly related and that might actually, you know, be seen as something that's, that's coming down on the side of the right. So, you know, one example is we had a report by a guy named Leif Rasmussen. He's a um, computer uh, science PhD student in Northwestern. It's about the rise of woke language in NSF grants. And so there's a story there about the politicization of academia. You know, maybe the research is or is not politicized, but at least you have to express fealty to certain ideas and it could potentially be related to economic and technological stagnation. 
I mean, the COVID-19, I mean, people probably wouldn't have thought that this it would have become such a partisan issue. But I think that what Philippe Lemoine has showed as another one of our research fellows is that the people who are implementing COVID restrictions aren't doing anything resembling cost-benefit analysis. I think if you look at it in an objective way, it's hard to see how it is justified. These things impose massive costs. And if they do help in, you know, reducing the spread of COVID, it's not, you know, it's not very obvious. It doesn't jump uh, out from the data. So you are imposing massive costs on people and their ability to live their normal lives for an, you know, at best an uncertain influence on, on the spread of COVID. And I think this is particularly too, true after vaccines became available. So I think, yeah, we're in a unique place in sort of the intellectual ecosystem and that we're sort of, you know, we have our foot in the camps of conservative slash libertarian thought, but at the same time, we're engaging in this broader discussion about technological and scientific progress. Yeah. I mean, I think if you, if I excise from the set of things that you write about or talk about just, just the woke kind of culture wars things. There are all kinds of areas like the rate of scientific progress or COVID that I think obviously people could engage from all sides without any particularly partisan, uh, rancor. Lamont's writing was fantastic. I mean, he, I think, I think he did some of the best analysis of the data that was available on COVID. That was maybe like a year ago or something. Is that right? Yeah. It's, um, he's, he's done a series of, yeah. Posts and yeah. essays last six, six months to a year. Yeah. And I mean, they've been picked up by the uh, New Yorker, one of the writers on COVID over there. It was picked up by uh, Andrew Gellman, who's a famous statistician who has a blog. So, yeah. yeah, I think by, you know, engaging with the sort of broader community of, you know, people, whatever their political orientation and just doing high quality work that smart people can appreciate, we could sort of have an extensive influence. Right. You know, we could do a whole show talking about science and technology and the rate of progress and whether there really has been a slowdown. This is something I've discussed with Tyler in the past. To be 100% honest, I don't think it's easy to really understand this question unless you are yourself a scientist and technologist, because it could be simply that a lot of the low-hanging fruit was picked in an earlier period, and it's nobody's fault, and maybe not even the fault of our institutions that progress seems to have slowed down. This is a pretty complicated topic. I, I don't mean to go into it fully here. We could, we can revisit it in some other conversation, but that alone, I think is worthy of quite a deep dive. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we can, we can go into it or not. I agree with you that it's very, very difficult to sort of measure these things and people do the best they can, but it's hard. And, you know, the, there's a response to the idea that the low hanging fruit is, well, they say, well, also at the same time, computing power is increasing and, you know, we have new tools like, you know, being able to sequence the genome cheaply. We have a lot more researchers and a lot more money being thrown at the problem. So it's, it's hard to know whether it's actually harder or easier. I mean, there's a lot of advantages that we have that previous generations didn't have. But I think there's, you know, there's certain areas like policy areas where you can look and you can say, okay, our institutions are really doing a bad job. So I think there's become something of a consensus among many that nuclear power is somewhere where we've really dropped the ball. This is a clean and effective and, and affordable source of energy. And just the regulations have been overly burdensome. You know, I would say stuff like in personnel management, we know, you know, IQ tests are better than a lot of things, but you know, they're not being used and there's going to be all kinds of unseen effects of not using the best methods we have to select people for different jobs or universities. And that's getting worse with, you know, colleges dropping the SAT. So I think there are areas like that where we can look at and say, okay, we're really dropping the ball somewhere. You know, even if it's getting harder, we are making mistakes and it's worth finding out, you know, where those places are. Yeah. I, I agree that there are many readily identifiable mistakes that are being made. You mentioned nuclear power. I think a kind of rational civilization looking back from a hundred years from now, we'll say, what, what was wrong with these guys for purely emotional kind of non-rational reasons? They left this power source untapped for a long time. If you read golden age science fiction from the fifties, you know, people like Robert Heinlein thought we'd be jetting around the solar system with nuclear powered spaceships. And he, he, people like Freeman Dyson even worked on designing such spaceships around that time. So yeah, I think for pretty much irrational reasons, we haven't exploited nuclear energy quite nearly as much as we could have. So we, we can revisit this question of the pace of scientific progress, but I, I want to move on to a slightly different topic, if you don't mind. For an old guy who, you know, grew up without the internet, maybe you can describe how you perceive the intellectual nexus that you're part of. It seems to me that just to, even in the last few years, we have this phenomenon of fairly well-known public intellectuals. I, I kind of put you in that category. You're, you're becoming a well-known public intellectual, mainly mediated by, I would say, social media. 
Substack, things like this. Now, I'm curious how that constellation of public intellectuals looks to you. I'm afraid that the ones that I like might be a little bit right shifted and I'm missing out on some that are on the left or, or maybe, maybe I am being kind of fair in the way that I absorb content and evaluate these people. So maybe, maybe you can just map out what you think the space looks like. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. So when I started writing, I said, oh, maybe I'm going to place op-eds in, you know, major newspapers and I'll get a lot of attention that way. And I've, I've been published on pretty much most, if not all of the, the major newspapers uh, in the United States. I would, I should say all there, you know, there's a few like USA Today, I've never published an op-ed, but I published in most of the most famous ones. And my Substack tends to get a much bigger readership. I mean, it gets a lot more attention than these, than these op-eds. I think people are used to you know, cause you're, when you're writing for a publication, they have a word limit, they have an in-house style. And I generally trust myself to be able to put the ideas together and to put them in a way that's appealing to a broad audience. It says something, you know, says something important. I don't set out and say, I'm going to write 2000 words, or I'm going to write 4,000 words. I sort of, you know, make the argument that I, I want to make. And if I need to make, you know, if I need to just include a figure, you know, a chart or a graph that's just, you know, copy and pasted from Pew Research, I can do that, which you can't do, you know, if you're just writing for the New York Times or something. I think it, it, there is just this sort of intellectual freedom and this, you know, this space to explore that you have with the new technology. I mean, namely Substack, Substack, you know, it's a sort of very minimalist design and the features. So like, if you look at like the blog platforms from 10 years ago, if you want to really do complicated stuff, it's probably worse. But I mean, what's great about Substack is it's so well integrated into everything. So you post something on Twitter, you send it through email, you send it through text message, you can download it on your Kindle. It just looks, looks really nice. You can get people to sign up and subscribe to your work. It's all integrated on the same system through Stripe. So Substack, you know, it's taken off for a reason. The intellectual space, the places where I am most active, I think that it's, I t tend to follow people who are, you know, better on their own than they are with an editor. So, you know, I think there's a, there, there are a lot of good, you know, there's a lot of interesting policy analysis done on the left. I think the people who came out of Vox, like Ezra Klein and Matt Iglesias, they do a lot of great work. I wish actually there was more conservatives who didn't just deal with big ideas, but sort of did the day-to-day -day of, you know, policy of, you know, what's in the latest stimulus bill and things like that. There's just, I think, a sort of an underinvestment in that kind of thing. And I think despite all the culture war concern among conservative or what's used to be called the intellectual dark web with sort of the cultural influence of wokeness and, and different policies that people get upset by, there's been less of a sort of a policy agenda and thinking about what politics can actually do to address the things people care about. One of my essays, Woke Institutions is Just Civil rights law was an attempt to actually, you know, provide that path forward. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting work being done. I think that I'm, I'm filling a niche and that I'm thinking about sort of, I care about the cultural issues a lot, but I'm thinking about them in a broader perspective. I'm thinking about, you know, politically, what is actually feasible? What can politics and policy accomplish? But you know, it's really, I mean, I mean it's great. There's just a lot of independent voices out there on foreign policy stuff. I mean, basically the right-wing papers and the left-wing papers, they pretty much sound the same. You have to go to Substack to see people now like uh, Brent Greenwald, who are just like, you know, more strenuous critics of American foreign policy, people like myself, people like that with those views can break out in the, in the op-ed pages sometimes, but they're drowned out by the, the sort of establishment foreign policy views that, you know, that, that still dominate today. So I, yeah, intellectually, I think it's an interesting time and I, you know, I, I hope where I hope it goes is towards actually more practicality, more trying to influence the world and doesn't turn into, you know, something of a debate club, which I think, I think certain circles, it's a trap that they fall into. I think that. You know, if you took a set of, I guess they would be assistant professors your age who are trained in social science, foreign policy, history, areas like this, I think most of them would envy you because, you know, you're not saddled with the day-to-day -day departmental stuff that they have to deal with. You're able to reach a broad audience. You're able to address a broad range of topics and, and you're getting people's attention. So you're kind of in a very enviable position. What do the economics of it look like for you? So you're not drawing an assistant professor salary, right? So somehow you, are you sustaining yourself through your Substack or through CSPI? <laughs> yeah, well, through CSPI, I get yeah, grants from CSPI. The Substack, it's not uh, feasible because I do not, I get, I get some subscriptions, but I do not paywall anything as of now. 
you know, I was talking to somebody uh, recently who had my, twice my free subscribers and uh, twice my Twitter followers. So he's somebody about, you know, twice as famous as I am, but he had something like eight to 10 times more paid subscribers just because he paywall stuff and I don't. So it's, it's really not feasible if you don't uh, paywall your material, although people will, you know, people who are really big fans of yours will contribute. So yeah, it, it's basically CSBI. Until recently, I was doing a lot of work for defense priorities. So I took a think tank salary from there. So yeah, I mean, it's part of the, um, the independent path is you have to, you have to sort of find your own funding. Was it difficult to raise the initial money for CSPI? Were they sort of wealthy donors that you already knew or how did that work? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've been lucky to have a few uh, big donors. These are people that I, I knew, you know, when I started to sort of dip my toes into the uh, public space and then you know, I was encouraged by a few of them to go ahead and do this. I just, you know, we were beating around these ideas for a while and they said, you know, go do it. I think there, I think there'll be a market for it. And, you know, as we've got out there, we've, we found other donors and we've gotten a lot of attention. Yeah, it's actually, it was not as hard as I would have thought. It's probably easier actually than getting an academic job at this point. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Where do you see yourself in say five or 10 years? Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I, you know, if you told me five years ago or 10 years ago that this is what I'd be doing, I would have been pretty, pretty surprised. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think at least for the next year or two, I'm going to write more on the topics I care about a lot about American foreign policy, um, a lot about the practical consequences of wokeness and what can be done about it. And also um, just bringing on, you know, smart people to CSPI to do important work. You know, when we get out there, the success builds on itself. So it's like sort of sending up a bat signal. Anybody who's in academia who, you know, wants to do work that they think is interesting and that's going to appeal to a large audience and maybe, the, you know, they can't necessarily do in academia or they'll do it in academia and nobody will pay attention to it. I mean, those people are finding us. So it's, it's great. There's a lot of opportunities out there. Well, I think it's an all-star team when I look at the page of uh, the, the various affiliates of CSPI, like. Philip Lamont, I think is Zach Goldberg, one of them as well. It's, it's people who have made uh, really important observations. What I actually want to turn to is the Great Awakening, which I think is based on Zach Goldberg's PhD research, but I think I may have learned about it first from you. Yes, the uh, term Great Awakening was coined by Matthew Glacius, who uh, wrote about what Zach had done for Vox. So Zach, I think, was the discoverer of the idea that Iglesias sort of, you know, coined the term that took off. Right. So I, I might be a little out of sync and maybe some listeners are already very familiar with this topic, maybe through Matt Iglesias. But for me, I, let, let me explain to you why I, I still find it interesting. To me, this awakening happened, you know, I'm in academia. I've been in academia, you know, my whole life. I was quite familiar with the furthest left radical left kind of views on all kinds of social issues. I was aware that they were slowly conditioning an entire generation of college students at many universities. Now, all kinds of ethnic studies courses and things like this are required of all the students on the campus to take. So these sort of far left academics now have, are in a very good position to indoctrinate entire generations of kids, but the whole thing kind of snuck up on me. I mean, here I am actually an administrator at a, a big, you know, big 10 university. And I had no idea how far to the left things had drifted while I wasn't paying attention. And <laughs> it's still kind of a mystery to me how this happened. And I think one of Zach's hypotheses for which there's empirical data is that it was actually a top-down phenomenon. So if you look at the usage of certain terminology, it was first in the New York Times and then propagated down. Do I have that right? Do I have those empirical results right? Yeah. So he wrote this up for a series of articles for Tablet. And basically he has the yearly data from, you know, the New York Times and the other major papers, how often they mention this sort of woke terminology like systemic racism and LGBTQ and things like that. And then you have public opinion among white Democrats and you could see sort of the, the sequential nature of what's going on. So yeah, the changing in the New York Times language precedes the shift in public opinion. And I, he's got other data in his dissertation that basically is similar. You know, the correlation between how much the New York Times talk about, talks about racism and the views of white Democrats on how big a problem they perceive racism to be is extremely, extremely strong over time. 
So yeah, that makes sense. The, the, the top down sort of understanding of this, you know, my, my theory, I don't know if Zach holds this too, but it, it really took off around the time that Twitter became popular around 2010, 2011, people like Cass Sunstein have talked about the radicalizing effect when you get people of similar ideologies in the same space. I think you got a lot of journalists and a lot of academics and a lot of activists sort of all talking to each other. And I think that had a radicalizing effect. I think, you know, the ubiquity of smartphones, they, they start to see these videos of uh, like police shootings and the aftermath of police shootings. Often, you know, you see them on Twitter, or they're often presented with no context at all. Just like, you know, this person had, was just arrested for being black or something. And then, you know, that all they'll have is the person being arrested. You won't have any context to that at all, but these things really take off. And then it, we saw the same thing with the alt-right, I think, was sort of also part of the same process where you had this radicalization on the right. But around 2015, 2016, internet censorship came down on it. And a lot of those people got kicked off the internet, basically. That didn't really happen until really the, the rise of Trump. I think a sort of a, a simple explanation, if I had to design one, it's basically social media and internet technology radicalized the elites. And then the elites started sending messages that got picked up by the general public. The portion of the public that listens to them, of course, a portion of the public, you know, hates the media and will do the opposite of what they say. But for the people who listen to them, I think that that's pretty much the process. Yeah, I think that comports with my impression. However, the role of academia in sort of preparing the battle space, maybe a, a decade or two before the events that you just described, I think is quite important. So, so whole generations of kids went through programs where they, they were taught a particular worldview that became yeah. you know, very firmly established so that, you know, all young staffers at the New York times and maybe even at Nike and things like this had certain beliefs that I think that I could be wrong about this, but it seems like maybe they learned in college. And so then, you know, the situation was ripe for this impact from social media and then maybe some downward pushing of ideas, you know, from the elite uh, sources like the New York times. So one of our researchers, Eric Kaufman, has also done research that relates to this question too. And what he finds, and he relies on other researchers found this too, is that it doesn't seem that people's political views change all that much during college. So if you look at like, you know, the political views of freshmen versus seniors, there doesn't seem to be a lot of movement there. So I, I don't know if college is necessarily brainwashing people. When I, when I taught undergrads, it seemed like for most of them, it went in one ear, out the other, whatever I was saying, but it seemed like there were a few who came to college and did become really into sort of the campus culture and started to, you know, speak the language of the professor. So, you know, maybe it's like a small minority that's particularly prone to being radicalized in this environment that went out in the world and had a, the outside is influence. I should amend what I said. So I did not mean to imply that the vast bulk of college students are really getting successfully indoctrinated. It, it, it's the ones who are eventually going to be the activists, the most radical the most, a category a friend of mine calls the berserkers, the ones who are really going to, you know, lead the charge when they're trying to affect some change yeah. or, or attack someone. Did you ever watch the Yale, uh, Halloween costume video where they're all yelling at Nicholas Christakis? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So if you, if, so if you go back, I, I watched the whole thing. And it seems like, you know, how many people were involved in this, this thing that, you know, became the focus of our intellectual culture, you know, there was like, you know, six or seven, maybe just yelling at him. And the, you know, that was enough to turn our intellectual culture upside down and make people think that there was something major happening at our university. So yeah, it doesn't take a lot of people. I think this is one of the themes of my, why is everything liberal essay is that most people, even if they have political views, you know, you can just pull them and see what the average is. You know, the average is a little bit right or a little bit left, but most people just want to be left alone. And, you know, they want to make money and have an, have a nice life and hang out with their friends. Those who care the most have a, you know, outsized influence. Right. And so, you know, it can be useful to study broad trends in public opinion, but I think it's probably more useful to look at what's happening with the sort of the most radicalized and energized and motivated portion of the population. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think it's a relatively small number of outliers that are really driving things. What my friend refers to as berserkers <laughs> and yeah, I'm probably not that different in age from Christiakis and. I saw those videos and I was just in shock because, you know, he was the, you know, we're not even allowed to use this term anymore probably, but he was the master of Silliman house so <laughs> at, at Harvard and Yale, the, the faculty member who lives in the residential college and runs it is called the master. Although I guess they've gotten rid of that title now. So he was the master of Silliman college and, and I used to have lunch in Silliman all the time because it's the closest 
residential college to the science complex at Yale. So where the physics building is. So I used to go, so I guess I was a fellow of Silliman when I was a professor there. And so I used to go to Silliman and they, they would give us free lunch because they wanted us mm -hmm. to interact with the undergrads. But the professors would all go to have lunch and we would all sit, uh, the, most of the professors just wanted to sit with other professors. And so I was one of the few that actually liked talking to undergraduates. But I knew that courtyard extremely well. And when I saw those kids yelling, I, I could not, in all my experience, I could never imagine students in the time that I was at Harvard and Yale yelling at the master in that way. It just, it was just shocking to me. But, you know, when you watch carefully, yeah, it is a very small number of kids probably that are really taking the lead. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, my undergrad was University of Colorado and people used to call it the Berkeley of the Rockies because it was sort of at the cutting edge of uh, a lot of this stuff, you know, for, uh, for a state school back when I went to college in the, you know, in the middle 2010s. I ran into ideas in college, you know, a uh, half decade or decade before I saw them out there in the real world. So I was introduced to the idea that gender is on a spectrum and we can't have two genders. Somebody said it in class once and, you know, there was a girl who was sort of self-satisfied, like she said something smart and I sort of chuckled to myself. This was really the first time I'd heard such a thing. And then, you know, in 10 years, it becomes conventional wisdom. So, yeah, I mean, I think this would have been sort of a laughable view to most people who were uh, undergrads at the same time I was. And then, yeah, 10 years later, I mean, you could see, especially on things like gender identity, you can see the direct line from the universities to the real world. Are you familiar with the foundation series by Isaac Asimov? Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with it. Yeah. So, you know, he has this conceit that there could be a subject called, I think, psychohistory. It, which is very mathematical, but it, it can actually predict the evolution of societies. And, you know, I, I never liked foundation series for that reason. I just thought this is ridiculous. It, it's not going to be that way. <laughs> like, uh, mm -hmm. Cycle history is not a real thing. And this is a good example because you and I lived through and everybody else lived through this great awakening. We had our antenna attuned to what was happening on campuses and you're younger than me. So you were more attuned also to what was happening in social media. But still, I think to, to actually demonstrate really what happened to kind of really pin it down is still kind of an open problem. Like, I don't feel, I wonder whether academics who write about this period 20, 30 years from now will get it right about what really happened. Yeah. I mean, do we have an understanding of what happened in the 1960s? I mean, it's hard to understand these things, right? A bunch of new ideas came in the 1960s that were pretty radical. I mean, the, it's some, you know, positive influence on society, some very negative influences on, on society. And I don't think we have like a standard explanation of what happened, right? These things are inherently mysterious. Yeah. I mean, part of my skepticism about the possibility of anything like psychohistory it makes me think, yeah, we might have still the wrong story about the fifties and sixties. Now, you know, it seems to me, I, I so I was a young kid in the early seventies and the sixties kind of lasted into the seventies actually. So some of this is familiar to me. And, you know, the thing is that there were very strong drivers in that period. So the kind of fifties post-war conservatism, there, there was obviously a very strong reaction against that. Mm -hmm. uh, among younger kids, teenagers. And then of course you had the Vietnam war, you know, the idea that you could get drafted and go to Vietnam and get killed. You sure. know, those, those are very strong drivers that could push society in various directions. I kind of, you know, wrongly accepted a bit of this Fukuyamaism that we had kind of entered into this stable, prosperous, we kind of have things figured out, you know, world. And so I, I don't see these super strong drivers that could cause radical change in society. That's why it kind of took me, one of the reasons why it kind of took me by surprise. Yeah. I mean, and not only Vietnam, you had um, sort of the, the moral certainty that came from the, uh, the civil rights movement. Yes. You know, one thing people say is that uh, basically you had TV footage from the first time of, you know, brutalization of black people in the South and that, you know, shifted public opinion. And so you had, you had that and sort of that moral cause, and then you had Vietnam. But it seems like even if you have n nothing sort of morally, you know, as uh, undeniable or as sort of, you know, inherently compelling as those things that were going on in the 60s and 70s, I mean, people can, you know, make, you know, people are good at sort of imagining moral causes, right? So gay marriage and then the trans issue and then police brutality. It seems like, you know, you're able to turn the volume up to 11, despite things that, you know, they might be problems, but they're probably not problems to the extent that people think, I think technology, technology is just very, very important here. Like to go back to social media, to go back to the fragmented nature of the media. I mean, you see it on the right, there's sort of a, um, 
you know, it's, it's a cliche to say the right wing echo chamber, but some ways I think it, I think it's good. I think it's prevented like the COVID hysteria. And I think the red states have had more uh, reasonable policies during COVID-19, but at the same time you have like this, this anti-vax stuff, right? That is nonsense. And you have these people that are sort of in their bubble. So it seems like just, you know, technology has allowed sort of, I think a lot of it is just reflection of human nature. I think there's people who just want to be angry, who like the sort of the sport of the sport of politics and, you know, conspiracy theories have always had a, uh, appeal to people. And I think there's, you know, sort of standard conspiracy theories on the right. And I think the left wing views about systemic racism and this, a lot of these things can be compared to a sort of conspiracy theory. Um, so it seems like there's, there's a lot more, uh, a lot more options out there for people to indulge in different ideas and form different kinds of communities. It seems to me, you know, if, if we did, I try to identify the, the big drivers, you know, in the sixties civil rights movement, Vietnam war, and maybe a kind of reaction against the conservatism of the fifties. So those were strong drivers. I think I agree with you that the one really strong driver that you can identify for these recent social upheavals is really the smartphone and social media. I mean, people, you know, my kids spend all their time, you know, looking at their phones and so, or everybody does now, I guess nowadays. And so, yeah, that's probably the main enabling factor that, that, that caused uh, all, all these things to happen just in the last five, 10 years. I mean, I'm glad I'm just old enough to remember, you know, the completely pre-internet days of politics. And, you know, so the 1990s is what I, you know, remember, I don't know, I'm not old enough to remember the 1980s, but in the 1990s, if you said, you know, what is politics or like, how did the average person think about politics? It was, you know, boring white men in a suit on one side, boring white men in a suit on the other side, talking about the budget. One says balanced budget and one says invest more in education and healthcare. And nobody was really excited about that. And there's sort of, this was the idea in the 1996 and 2000 elections that it really doesn't matter who, who wins. They're all just sort of nameless faces, you know, that are basically going to do the same thing. And I think if you were somebody who was interested in politics, you couldn't get it in sort of a infotainment format, right? You'd have to like yeah. read the New York times or watch CNN. And this is CNN, like the same CNN in 1990s before it became sort of more tabloidy. And that was just boring, I think, to most people. And then you have, you know, right wing talk radio, I think really pioneered sort of the infotainment business. Then you have Fox News coming, I think in the late 1990s. And then you have these things on the left too. It seems like, you know, the, the fragmentation of the media landscape, it seems like these things are really important. So I'm conscious of the time we've been on probably an hour now. And the next topic I was going to go into was your book. Do, do you feel like you still have energy to uh, discuss your book a little bit? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I can, I think I can go, I think I can go quite a bit longer. So sure. Oh, great. Okay. So you, your new book is entitled public choice theory and the illusion of grand strategy, how generals, weapons, manufacturers, and foreign governments shape American foreign policy. And I guess for my audience, we should first define what public choice theory is because I think not everybody's familiar with that term. Maybe can you give me a, a, a one or two sentence definition of public choice theory? Sure. Public choice theory uh, came out of economics, and it's basically the idea that you use economic analysis with the focus on the uh, rational individual as the fundamental unit of analysis, and you use that to explain political outcomes. So there's more specific applications of it, but at a broad level, that's, that's basically the idea. So rather than, you know, sometimes when we discuss foreign policy, we sort of describe the state as a unitary actor, like Russia wants this and the Italians no. want this. And what you'd like to do maybe is disaggregate that into individual, maybe not all the way down to the individual person level, but certainly to interest, powerful interest groups that are working, that have their own incentives and it's their activities that actually shape what we call foreign policy by nation states. Is, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, exactly. So public choice, I mean, has had a much bigger role to play in analyzing American politics than international relations and international relations has been pretty wedded to the unitary actor model that you just have to sort of think of states, you know, as the, as the fundamental unit of analysis and you go from there. Now, so we talk about things like grand strategy. What does the United States want? What kind of, you know, world is it trying to shape? What does it want out of this conflict or that? And we don't really, you know, we don't think about a lot of domestic politics like this. So what is American grand strategy on immigration? For example, it's a, uh, one of the things I talk about in my book, there's basically an idea. There was a, you know, a legislative history between 1965 immigration act 
And then basically, you know, that had all kinds of unintended consequences. It was updated in the uh, early 1990s and there've been little changes at the edges, but there was no grand strategy of the kind of immigration policy we had. We had a law, it had some consequences that were intended, some unintended, and then basically we're here. And same thing with the healthcare system. You could see sort of these incremental changes. Everything is built on, you know, the system that came before it. And so nobody would be silly enough to say, what is the American government's grand strategy in healthcare? You know, what, what are they trying to accomplish? We, we know that there's just a lot going on and there's interest groups and there's the voters and then there's just concentrated interests and there's, you know, status quo bias and all these things. So I'm basically, I'm trying to understand American foreign policy in a similar way. I think that some people in, in academics who study international relations do do this unquestionably, but I don't think that the field as a whole or our public discourse surrounding geopolitical issues, I don't think it takes this perspective seriously enough. So uh, a couple chapters, first two chapters of the book is basically laying out the theory. Um, and then the most of the rest of the book is going into different aspects of American foreign policy, like the sanctions regime, like where we station troops abroad and trying to see whether it can be explainable through the grand strategy model or through a public choice model. And my argument is the public choice model gives you a better understanding of what's going on. So, so once again, I, I, I can't help but agree with, you know, in the case of your book, what your assertions are. That example of immigration, there's clearly no U.S. grand strategy on immigration. There's not agreement on the facts. There's not agreement yeah. on some theory of, you know, the impact of immigration on, on working class people, on elites. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a, just a giant mess with competing interests. And it's obviously what happens in U.S. policy regarding immigration is clearly the, it's an emergent thing, which involves lots of different competing influences. And I, I think having spent a little bit of time talking to people in the intelligence and defense worlds and at think tanks, it's also clear that there isn't any kind of universal theory of geo strategy. People disagree yeah. violently on, you know, uh, what the consequences would be of a particular military strategy or, or strategic move. And so. I never understood this idea of a unitary actor. Now, if I were Brzezinski or Kissinger and I was writing sort of as if I were actually in control of U.S. foreign policy and this is what I would do and this is why I should do it, it's obviously a fiction. But from that yeah. perspective, just to lay out an argument for what would be in the best interest of the U.S., I think I can accept, you know, talking about a unitary actor in that context, but that's clearly not how things get decided. Yeah, it's much worse than, you know, immigration. I mean, we, we have, you know, our problem, maybe, maybe it's similar, you know, we don't even agree, like, what should be the goal of the U.S. foreign policy? Should we be maintaining international peace? Should we be taking care of humanitarian issues and trying to make the world a better place? Should we be trying to democratize the rest of the world? Should we mind our own business and only care about our, the narrow self-interests of the nation? I mean, we, we really, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a jumble. And when somebody in uh, the think tank world or in an op-ed or whatever says, you know, something is in the national interest, they could be talking about just about anything. You know, they could be talking about like, you know, national pride or, or something that's not even tangible. I think that a lot of the foreign policy elites, they're good at post hoc justifications of why, you know, we have to be doing what we're doing. But, you know, you, you notice that there's such a high correlation between what we're doing now and what we're doing in the past that it doesn't seem like there's a consistent theme here because circumstances change and we keep doing the same thing. So one of the figures in the book shows the American true presence abroad in 1950 and the American true presence abroad in 2019. And they're basically in the same places. The places hoping, hosting the most troops are basically Italy, Germany, Japan, and South Korea, right? So the access powers and then the Korean in war, right? Yep. And what are the odds that the grand strategy in 1950 called for American presence in the exact same places you had in uh, 2019? If you look at this with the Afghanistan war, where we go there to, you know, fight Al-Qaeda and prevent another 9-11 and bring the people who plan the 9-11 tax to justice. And then, you know, we, as we go on, it becomes about building democracy and women's rights. And people bring up, you know, showing resolve because China and Russia are watching. And if, you know, if the U.S. leaves, those countries are going to start doing bad things. And, you know, they're just very, very good at sort of ad hoc, you know, changing the story about what we're doing at any particular time. I think foreign policy, you know, is, is sort of unique in sort of the extent to which we have this need for uh, coherence to, to tell ourselves a story about how it all makes sense. And you could see why people who are foreign policy elites and presidents, you know, would have an incentive to play along. They want to portray themselves as shaping world events, not necessarily just reacting to interest groups and this acting in accordance with the status quo bias and following public opinion or intellectual fads. But, you know, if you, I think if you think about it carefully and you really analyze what's going on, I think it's very hard to get there that that's actually what's going on. 
So is, is the thesis of your book considered radical or heterodox? Are, are you anticipating that lots of academic IR people are going to attack you or consider your book unrealistic? <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if like, you know, how, how much they're going to actually, you know, notice it. I think it's gotten a lot of attention outside of the field, but you know, I'm not in academia anymore, so I'm not really in those uh, circles. So a lot of them might notice it or they might not. If they did notice it, some of course have, it's not like nobody has seen it. I, th I think they're open to this critique because I really take seriously you know, sort of the intellectual history of international relations and sort of what the basis of the unitary actor model is supposed to be. I know this literature well, and I can say, you know, exactly what's wrong with it. You know, it's, sometimes it's hard within international relations. Like, you know, there's people uh, who call themselves realists, people who are, you know, opposed to neoconservatism. They're opposed to sort of ideology or idealism playing a large role in international affairs. And those people, although from a uh, positive perspective, they're committed to the unitary actor model, to understanding foreign policy. At the same time, like, when they're making normative suggestions, they're always criticizing American foreign policy for, you know, giving into this interest or that interest or acting, you know, in a stupid way. So it, it's sort of interesting that there's a lot of people who share my critiques of foreign policy, but I just, I would argue that they don't go far enough in, in, in seeing how the critiques that I make and the critiques sometimes that they share sort of really undercut their theory about the way the world works. Yeah, I, I imagine, though, people who have some experience in D.C. who see how the sausage is actually made would find your characterization of how these decisions come to be much more plausible, right? I mean, very realistic. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really depends. I mean, some of them, you know, have a, like, like we said, have a uh, sort of a, you know, a psychological or a career interest in the unitary actor model and presenting American foreign policy is a lot more coherent than it is. And, you know, the, the top, you know, levels of uh, the government are appointed by the president. So they're to a large extent, political actors, international relations is an interesting field because you look at like foreign affairs, which is not the most you know, famous academic journal, but it's considered a serious academic journal. And a lot of their, you know, people publishing in there are like people like Henry Kissinger or Condoleezza Rice. So the field does have a sort of a intimate relationship with power in a way that a lot of other fields don't have. So I think there is a tendency to sort of accept the establishment narrative of what the U.S. is actually doing abroad. But I think anybody who's like known some generals and watched what they do after they retire <laughs> and how, you know, uh, budget decisions are made about big ticket weapon systems and things like things like that, they have to they have to acknowledge <laughs> it's special interests really, you know, it's, it's a little bit like this woke discussion we were having earlier where most people are not following it very carefully. They don't have a big dog in the fight or anything, but there's some special interest group, you know, Raytheon or whatever that really cares about how a particular decision goes. And they're exerting maximum pressure on the system to, to try to get what they want in Washington. And yeah, surely people who are familiar with Washington must acknowledge that. Yeah, my impression of just listening to people sort of who've been in Washington and talking to them about these things is that they will readily acknowledge that, you know, some interest group might have an influence on American foreign policy. But I still think there's a, for a lot of them, there's a tendency to see sort of the big picture as still having more, you know, coherence than it does. So like a typical thing somebody might do is they might say, uh, you know, why does the U.S. antagonize Russia? They're going to push it close to China. China is the, you know, is the real threat to the United States. So some people will say that. And so they'll, they'll maybe acknowledge whatever forces are pushing us towards being a little more antagonistic to Russia. But at the same time, they're sort of buying into the idea that American foreign policy is or like can in really a coherent way actually focus on China, right? So they're still accepting that there is some kind of grand narrative that there was worth fighting for rather than just sort of a lot of disconnected policy decisions that are based on inertia, status quo bias, politics that, you know, that aren't really connected to one another. Uh, so I think this idea of like grand strategy and, you know, the rational actor, unitary actor model, I think it's very deeply embedded to the way people think about foreign policy. And if my book was just like, oh, you know, interest groups sometimes have an influence on American foreign policy, you know, it wouldn't be saying anything new or anything a lot of people can disagree with. I'm presenting, I think, a more radical critique of just the way we talk about it and the way we think about foreign policy. Even if people accept, you know, some portions of that argument, you know, I think that's hard to swallow for a lot of people. I see. I mean, I, I do think that if I'm trying to explain what U.S. strategy should be, you know, I, I feel it's okay to say, okay, if there were a unitary actor, say you had a very strong, you know, unusually strong president and political party and uh, political regime in power that 
you know, if they really could have their way in all these decisions, this is how they should view the chessboard and this is how they should strategize. I think that's okay. But then obviously you have to be realistic about what really can happen given constraints from domestic politics, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. So you, you mentioned the current geopolitical situation where it seems to me that the United States is just crazy in pushing Russia into the arms of China. It just seems like the stupidest possible thing. And sometimes I just cannot understand how, you know, what poor strategic thinkers are, our so-called leaders or, or policy intellectuals or, or, or have you are in what they're doing right now. It just, it seems a hundred percent wrongheaded to me. Yeah. I mean, the geopolitical situation is, is sort of simple. I mean, Russia cares a lot more about Ukraine than the U S does. And Russia has sort of the power to influence Ukraine more than we do, or to exert its will through economic, or ultimately we, there might be military coercion by the time people are listening to this. A lot of it is driven by ideology interest groups. So for example, the decision to expand NATO, and there was an article up, uh, actually Peter Beinart's uh, Substack the other day points out that when the NATO uh, expansion after the fall of the Soviet Union was originally on the table, a lot of the prominent uh, minds in foreign policy, people like Henry Kissinger and George Kennan uh, were saying, what are you doing? This is crazy. Why are we expanding uh, NATO? Why are we getting closer to Russia? There's, there's no reason for this. And it seems like, you know, American establishment really wasn't thinking about it this much. There was lobbying from these Eastern European countries. There's lobbying from NATO itself. There was a committee set up by a guy named Bruce Jackson, who was a Lockheed Martin executive who was really pushing for NATO expansion. And, you know, there was a financial, there was a clear financial interest there. And we just, we just sort of, we just did it. And then we kept expanding NATO and there's sort of a, you know, there, there's a bureaucracy there to keep it going. And we just keep getting closer and closer to Russia. And finally, you know, we reach, you know, you're, you're about as far east as you can go without getting to Ukraine, which is, you know, what we Russians consider, you know, central to their uh, self-conception of, of a nation. It's, it's having some kind of relationship with Ukraine, not letting it fall into the, uh, into the Western orbit. And, you know, these people have been thinking about these things in a certain way for, uh, for a long time. It's given them, you know, prestige and status as, you know, as champions of the transatlantic alliance. And... You know, I think if we had a grand strategy and I, maybe Biden would want to do this if it was po politically plausible, we would just tell the Russians that, you know, Ukraine is not going to go into NATO. I mean, there's nothing vital here for American security. I, I, I think he may have given them private assurances to that effect without producing the written document that they wanted. The thing is, it's hard to make that credible, right? Because even when we sign an agreement, we're like the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, one of the problems with Iran now is basically Republican senators like Tom Cotton and Ted Cruz, they're saying that any Republican in office is going to tear it up and they're probably yep. right. So that's yep. even if you get a signing. So I wouldn't trust a private assurance so, you know, if I was, if I was the Russians at this point, but this is one of the problems of grand strategy. It's like there's a political winds change, the administration change, and the president actually has a lot of power, but that, you know, stops there from being really coherent across administration. So I think Biden actually might, you know, if it was just up to him. He's shown some skepticism of sort of the more hawkish views in the foreign policy establishment. He showed skepticism over Libya. He pulled out of Afghanistan. He was skeptical of Afghanistan even a decade ago when he was in the Obama administration. So you could imagine him, you know, giving up on the, you know, the idea that Ukraine will eventually be uh, integrated into NATO and, and the EU. But I don't think he could do that even if he wanted to. So it looks like, you know, that we're in a pretty bad position. Yeah, I, I, I kind of have the gut feeling that Biden's instincts are not entirely wrong on these issues. And he, he really is looking for a way to extricate ourselves from this without getting into a hot war with Russia. But on the other hand, who knows who's really making the calls, like what, you know, to what extent he's really in control of the situation. Yeah, I think the Afghanistan pullout, he got really killed politically and yep. you get, you know, it, it, usually the media, you know, usually they're a left-wing media. And so they're usually can defend sort of the Democrats cover them, you know, when something bad happens, you know, there's a little bit of a cushion that they have, right? But on foreign policy, it's actually not like that. There's sort of the way that uh, foreign policy reporting works is the people who become the, the most important journalists are the ones who are the closest to the government because they're relying on leaks and classified information and access to the generals and the national security bureaucracy. So the foreign policy, you know, foreign policy reporters at places like the New York Times and the Washington Post, despite these places becoming very woke, 
on everything related to domestic politics. I mean, it's still basically the New York Times that, you know, had a faction within it pushing for the Iraq war. It's not that, you know, extreme, but basically you have this media that will, that will be really, really tough on a, a Democratic president for not being hawkish. And then the Republicans, although, you know, people say, oh, they're moving away from being pro-war. They hate liberals more than they care about actual foreign policy accomplishments, right? So a lot of them were for the Afghanistan withdrawal when it was Trump doing it. And then they became anti-Afghanistan withdrawal when their Biden was doing it. Some of them were consistent. I mean, most Republicans in the Congress are still pretty hawkish. It's still closer to a Bush Cheney party than a Trump party. If you're just looking at members of Congress rather than sort of intellectuals on Twitter, where it's a little bit more balanced, this populism, this new populism has more of a presence, any kind of, you know, accommodation with Russia. I think he thinks he's going to get killed on. And there's, you know, there's really not many options there. We're not going to go to war with Ukraine. One of the things they've been talking about in the recent days is sending more troops to places like Poland and Romania. Like, okay, like that's not going to change what's happening in Ukraine. It makes you look tough, right? That you're like confronting the Russians. They'll probably put sanctions on, which generally don't work and don't do anything, but they could, they could bring some suffering to the Russian people, to the Russian economy. So there's really not a lot of good options here. If you look at sort of Biden's political incentives, they don't really line up with what would be a rational settlement to the issue, which is just, you know, acknowledging that Russians care more about Ukraine and are more willing to go far to influence policy there. Well, we simply are not. I really don't think the Russians want to get involved in a military confrontation in Ukraine. I, I think Putin is really most worried about the U.S. putting missiles there. And, you know, I, I think it's very similar in, in a way to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I think to me, their next move may be to place some missile assets closer to the United States, to the continental United States, just to reinforce to us that, you know, this is how it feels when, you know, your potential enemy or adversary starts placing missiles within just a few minutes of key targets in your country. Yeah. Yeah, and this gets to like sort of the hypocrisy around the whole discourse. They say, well, we can't rule out NATO membership because Ukraine is a uh, independent nation, so it can make its own decisions. You know, I mean, how did that work out during the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? How does that work out when Russia or, or China, you know, starts doing things with Venezuela? Even like economic relationships between China and Venezuela are treated by the United States as some kind of threat to the United States, much less a military alliance or placing missiles. So yeah, I mean, these arguments that the foreign policy uh, hawks make don't sound, you know, credible when you just imagine if the situation was reversed, you know, they would make a completely different argument, but, you know, they still stick with them despite, you know, despite these very obvious critiques you can make. Yeah. I don't, I don't think they ever demand this kind of internal consistency or, or symmetry or, or they, they ignore the golden rule. Like you, you, they never try to understand what it looks like from Putin's point of view that that's just beyond their ken, I think. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, the lack of self-awareness is just, you know, mind blowing. So, I mean, the HR McMaster, the former national security advisor, he goes around saying we need strategic empathy. And then you read like, what he means by strategic empathy? It's just like, figure out how to like, you know, thwart these people and whatever they want to do. So Robert Wright has a yeah, great sub stack where he writes about foreign policy and he, you know, he actually tries to apply the idea of strategic empathy towards understanding foreign countries, potential adversaries. And it just doesn't, you know, the common sense use of the, the term doesn't match what, you know, the, the way that the foreign policy establishment uses these words, so not just strategic empathy, but things like, you know, uh, rules-based international order or like, you know, deterrence, you know, these terms are often either ill-defined or they're defined in inconsistent ways. And I guess that's one of the things that made me want to study foreign policy is I thought that the, the thinking around it was, you know, really, really bad. And I could improve, you know, the way we thought about these things, but, you know, I started to believe that there was, that the thinking is, the thinking is bad because there's an incentive for the thinking, because it allows us to continue on the doing what we've been doing. When I was growing up, I, I played a lot of uh, board games, not, not just Dungeons and Dragons type games, but kind of things which were meant to be realistic simulations of modern warfare, World War II, things like this. And anybody who's played those games, typically you don't just play one side, <laughs> you played all the sides. And so it's very easy for you to understand, like, okay, if I push this close into the Ukraine, the Russians are going to have to respond this way, right? And it's just amazing to me that people who pass themselves off as foreign policy specialists or even military strategists, I think don't have even that level of understanding that a kid who just happened to have spent a few years playing these games would have about the actual situation. Yeah, I mean, I think at the heart of it, I think there is a sense of 
they don't want to say this out loud, but there is a sense of moral superiority. It's the idea that Russia is a dictatorship. They don't protect human rights. We are um, a democratic nation. So we get to play by different rules uh, compared to these countries that, you know, don't have legitimacy. Yeah, that now. is absolutely it's absolutely the case that they, they are operating from that yeah. sense of moral superiority. And they, they'll often like when I'm debating people like this, they'll say, don't don't try to suggest that there's any false equivalence between us and them. And and they really do feel this way. But then my next question to them is, can we just descriptively at least then just, you know, I'm not suggesting there's moral equivalence, but just put yourselves in their shoes. How would you react if you were Putin and you saw this happening? What would you do? And yeah, exactly. um, even that exercise, I think, is pretty hard for them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I would push back on, you know, the idea, don't make this moral equivalency between the U.S. and its adversaries. I mean, neither Russia or China has done anything abroad that compares in the destructiveness to the Iraq war, right? So if you want to say, oh, don't make a, you know, moral equivalency, I mean, you have to sort of answer for the humanitarian consequences of American wars and also American sanctions. I mean, you do the, well, you do the Italian well. Yes, right. They meant, yeah, they, they do it because they're, you know, evil and sitting in a lair, you know, rubbing their hands together. And we just, you know, make these honest mistakes, right? But even if you give them, even if you don't demand the moral equivalency, uh, you just say, yes, America is good, they're evil, but at least maybe you could acknowledge they're somewhat rational. So then how mm -hmm. are they going to react when you do X? Yeah, I think, I think that's what CNN and lots of these people were saying when we were expanding NATO to the further to the east that they could just see that eventually you get a nonlinear response and where the cost benefit is just completely wrong. Like, what, what are we getting out of this to have to deal with that nonlinear response? Yeah, I think that when you grant that like a side is evil or you start with the premise, I think that kind of sort of rational analysis becomes very, very hard. So, you know, we see this, I think, in, in a lot of wokeness in the morally charged places in domestic politics. Like if you want to have a rational discussion, OK, like a liberal has something like, you know, anti-discrimination laws. And you just want to have, you know, a rational discussion, like what kind of incentives does this create? You know, what are the effects or something like, you know, affirmative action. Once you sort of acknowledge that, you know, racism is like the ultimate evil. And so anybody who commits racism, like you don't think about their incentives or like what they might do, right? You just have to sort of force them to do what you want. So I think that this is actually, you know, if you want a hawkish foreign policy, this is a smart strategy. I remember the run up to the Iraq war. There's just a lot, tons and tons of stuff about Saddam Hussein and human rights violations and all the poor people he oppressed. And in that climate, it's just really, really hard to say, okay, does this war, you know, make any sense? Because you are always like so close to being, you know, sympathetic with Saddam Hussein. It's like trying to defend, you know, Nazis who want to speak and someone's shutting down their speech. It's just very hard because these people are seen as so evil that you can't make a principled free speech argument or talk about their incentives or interests or anything like that. So I think this is actually, if you want to, you know, understand what's going on in like the foreign policy discourse and why it's pathological. I think this idea of just the other side being evil is just a real hindrance to understanding. Well, I agree that that kind of moralism is, you know, as Frank Herbert would say, the mind killer, right? Like that definitely kills your ability to reason rationally about this. The, the, the earlier stuff like Iraq war, you know, like sort of luxury wars that we, we could either choose to have or not have, you know, that was an era of American supremacy, but here we could lose. <laughs> we could, <laughs> she has more newts than we do. And so I just think these people have completely, they're completely bonkers. We cannot even conceive of what really, how ugly this kind of military confrontation could get either with Russia or with China. I think they just do not get it. Yeah, these are, these are tail end risks and you're right. I mean, Russia, I mean, has the ground forces to fight a war in, you know, Eastern Europe. We have some troops there, but not really. But they, they also have, you know, I think people have not updated their view of how modern war actually works. Like they think we could get air superiority, but what's actually going to happen is that they're going to knock out all our bases in Europe with missiles right away. And uh, it's going to be extremely ugly. Yeah. And then you think, I mean, you're not even bringing in, you know, nuclear weapons and it's a really ugly situation and you do have these tail end risks that you have to take seriously. And we're not taking it seriously, unfortunately. I think that there's a desire to see what these people are doing in foreign policy, you know, they're serious and they're, you know, they take the gravity of the situation, they give it its due. And, you know, we just don't see that. I mean, if you look back in my book, I talk about the decision to go into Iraq and Afghanistan and the sort of the strategy that we took there, what, what was the plan to basically occupy the, those countries indefinitely. And 
it's shocking if you know people are interested uh, go read the part on on iraq in particular but also the part in afghanistan uh just how cavalier you know bush and those around him were about making these decisions they just you know they decided to invade iraq a month after the invasion of iraq they still didn't know whether they would hand it over to the exiles or they would basically undertake a long and extensive occupation they chose the latter but really it was done with very little discussion very little thought and you know they just made the decision and moved on it's sad to think that that's probably what's going on here too with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, of course, there the issue, the thing that they were playing cavalierly with were the lives and futures of Iraqis, right? Whereas now they're playing cavalierly with the lives of hundreds of millions of Americans if we actually end up in a hot war with yeah. the Russians or the Chinese. So it's, it's much higher stakes, actually. So that's what scares me is that there doesn't seem to be, you know, at least say what you want about the Cold War, but it was actually conducted with a certain amount of analytical professionalism where, where people were very keenly aware of the stakes. And I think this is maybe is a little bit of physicist chauvinism on my part, but a lot of the people who had input into policy during the Cold War were the physicists who had actually built the bombs. And they, I think we're much, much more realistic, for example, than the current crowd that runs U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> yeah, it's another one of my themes that I write about, sort of the proliferation of expertise. And you have people who will, you know, narrower and narrower expertise and not very broad knowledge or understanding of the world. Yeah, it's a problem more generally. And I think we're really seeing it in foreign policy as much as anywhere else. Yep. Well, I think we're way over time. Let me, let me just close with... One thing, and, and, and I should say to my listeners, I, I'm going to eventually be on your podcast, so we'll have more discussions. And obviously, I'd love to have you back on this one, because obviously, there, there are lots of things you and I enjoy discussing. Let me just end with a question about democracy. So I, I just want to ask you how pessimistic or optimistic you are about the functioning of democracy. So there's some political science research uh, from a group at Princeton that seemed to suggest that whenever the elites oppose the wishes of the majority, the elite tends to get its way. And this is a sort of empirical study of U.S. politics going back, you know, maybe a hundred years. If, if you took that, if you're a Chinese political theorist and, and you want to really take that to an extreme, we would assert that maybe the American democracy is a little bit of a sham. You know, I'm curious whether you find that to be a reasonable criticism uh, of our system. Like how does our system actually work? Not, not how it's portrayed to work, but what is really mm -hmm. going on in terms of how preferences are aggregated in our political system. Yeah. So if you're thinking about the sort of the justifications for democracy, you know, I don't think the justification that the people get what they want is necessarily the strongest ground to stand on because some, as someone who knows a little bit about public opinion, it's very fickle. It depends on how you ask the question. It depends on how you frame things. So it's, you know, very hard to go like, you know, from what, you know, the, the public real wants, it's hard enough to figure that out to get the policy. And any realistic system is going to have to account for the fact that most times in most places, people are just not paying much attention. Maybe, you know, public opinion has a role to play in whether we actually go to war with Russia, but like everything that led to this point, like bringing Moldova and Montenegro into NATO, you know, most people don't even know that happened, much less have an opinion on it or are able to, you know, influence what we're doing. The better argument for democracy is that, you know, it's just a way to have peaceful transitions of power, right? And I think if that is how you understand democracy, I think we have that. I think a lot of the stuff about, you know, the end of democracy, a lot of it is just being upset that there's outcomes that people don't like, like in Eastern Europe, a lot of these countries, people are voting for socially conservative parties who don't support uh, LGBT rights and who want to uh, restrict immigration, particularly in places like Hungary and Poland. The idea that, you know, democracy is sort of falling often rests on the idea that, you know, whatever we don't like as, you know, elite American academics is undemocratic. I think democracy, you know, as peaceful transition of power, I think that's pretty safe in the West. People have concerns about Trump overturning the election, even, you know, even if it's like the ways that the, that was trying to be done, that was through legal mechanisms, you know, that would have been a norm breaking to just, you know, give the electoral votes in these states to Trump when Biden won the state. So I could see how people can be upset about that, but it's still, you know, it's, it's within the technical legal limits of what the American system allows. So as definitionally, I think we're going to remain a democracy as far as how well it works. You know, I'm very concerned. I think what I say about foreign policy applies to other areas. I think there's interest groups capture. I think that you have more democratic participation in a way than ever people like care more about politics than they did 20, 30 years ago. But often caring about politics means hating the other side or just like cheering on like you're a football team. And, you know, they have this uh, sort of polarization. 
And that doesn't necessarily get you the best policy outcome. I think democracy is safe and whether it works well in the U.S., I, I don't think many people would say that it does right now. Yeah, I would say that as a system for preference aggregation, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. And as you pointed out, it's not even clear how to define what the preferences of the broad body politic are at any given moment. This idea that it provides for stable transfers of power, orderly transfers of power, I think that is probably the best justification for democracy to, to provide the people with some idea that they have a circuit breaker, they, they can remove a ruler that they, they really despise. This recent election, though, if you look at the polling, it seems to me there is a very substantial chunk of the population. I think people don't want to acknowledge this, but it could be like 30% of the population just doesn't think this administration is legitimate. So that, that's getting pretty close to not having a good handover of power. So I haven't looked this up, but I would be surprised if it was that much different for the last administration. I mean, I think, and I think probably there was something to it. I think there was probably something similar after Bush v. Gore. And then Obama, you had the whole birth certificate thing and, you know, Trump, you know, became a major political figure basically on the birth certificate idea. I don't think, you know, like poll results like that, I wouldn't worry about too much. It's really what's going on with elites, what's going on with political leaders that I think is important. So uh, yeah, the polls, people just don't think it's legitimate. I mean, people will tell a pollster anything if something becomes politicized, right? They'll say something that sounds good for their tribe. Does that necessarily mean that democracy is falling apart? I, I don't think so. I think the institutions are strong. I think that was actually a lesson from January 6th. I mean, the entire system basically stopped to stopped anything from going forward that would have overturned the results of the election. If you just looking at like your measure is like how much people, people hate each other. And this is like something like people like Peter Turchin point to, who I disagree with, who I wrote an op-ed taking issues with his view about a year and a half ago. I don't think that that stuff is necessarily what matters. I think it's more political currents and institutions and what elites are doing. I'm glad you expressed your point of view on that because I, I'll have to go back and think about that because uh, it is very possible that. You know, the polling results that so alarmed me after 2020 are, are actually more characteristic of typical presidential. Yeah, you can get a lot of crazy results for public opinion. And usually, you know, when people are building a narrative, it's the easiest thing in the world is to design a poll that will give you that result because public opinion is often very, very crazy. But, you know, it's pretty much always been the case. Great. Well, I think maybe we should stop here. It's been great to have you on the podcast. And as I said, I, I look forward to being on your podcast. And I look forward to having you back again in the future. It's been a pleasure, Steve. Thanks. This was fun. All right. Thanks.